Uh, I have uh, two friends that were talking a few days ago about uh, engines, uh, and they, they have a lot of money. And they were talking about building something uh, quite powerful with a lot of, of uh, horsepower. And I tried to, to understand the discussion and the reasons behind uh, they, uh, the, what they wanted to, to buy. Uh, my name is Pepla. I'm a consultant at Percona. Uh, I have more than 30 years of experience that makes me feel really very old, uh, extremely old. And currently I'm located in Barcelona. This is why I can take pictures like this one. This was working uh, at uh, the beach. Uh, let's have a quiz time. Name that database. It's a popular open source database. It was originated by a guy, by a guy uh, with um, the first name Michael. Michael has a history of saying some outrageous things, and he has formed several companies. I guess you already know which database we are talking about. And the answer is Postgres, MySQL, or MariaDB, or Vertica. It's just a funny thing that both uh, companies uh, have in the origin uh, the same name, Michael, but different Michaels. So how, how to compare uh, databases? Back to my two friends. Uh, one of my friends was considering buying this one. This is a Ferrari Roma with uh, 620 horsepower. The price, it's some months I don't earn that amount of money. Uh, and is the ideal car if you are Jason Stratham. And the other one is uh, John Deere 9R 640. It's called 640 because it has 640 uh, uh, horsepower, and the list price is uh, three times, around three times the price of a Ferrari. And uh, it's ideal if you are a farmer, a huge farmer, you, you, you can do a lot of things with uh, such a tractor. So how to compare things? Well, the first thing you need to do is to check the features. And this is very easy, you just need to build a list of your requirements, compare the candidates to see which one fits best, and don't assume they have the same features. When I said engines, and I said the horsepower, uh, probably you were thinking sports cars, and but you have also tractors. And if you are a farmer, and you uh, go to your farm with a Ferrari, you will <laughs> not succeed. So it's very important to consider uh, uh, the, the, the features. And you could do that. So it, this is not something, I mean, you can uh, attend a conference and I could just take the list of features and compare and say this one and this one. But um, I think it makes no sense. And this is not what this presentation is about. And it also, it's not about the licensing. Why? Because there's a lot of heat uh, regarding the licensing uh, 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 topic. And uh, there are lots of different opinions. Uh, uh, I'm just going to talk for, sh for a short period, uh, a few words about MySQL. If we compare the advance that MySQL has done uh, in the last years, and we uh, check the companies that were ruling MySQL at the time, probably we would get some surprises. 
I'm not an Oracle employee at all. Uh, I'm not paid by Oracle, but uh, for example, my SQL 8 is quite bad compared with uh, my SQL 5.1. Okay. <coughs> Uh, while preparing this, this presentation, I learned about a concept called the Birmingham screwdriver. Uh, I don't know if you know what's a Bir Birmingham uh, screwdriver. I was not aware of that. This is a Birmingham screwdriver. Okay. There's something called the law of the instrument. The law of the instrument, uh, in Spanish, uh, uh, we have... Uh, 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 sayings about this, but it's just if you have a hammer, you tend to treat everything as a nail. Uh, if you know my SQL, you tend to consider that my, my SQL is better. If you know Postgres, you tend to consider that Postgres is better. And this is something I recommend you to Google, which is better. MySQL or Postgres. And you will find a ton of uh, people saying, I remember I worked with X 10 years ago, and I'm a Y DBA, and Y is quite better. Well, you are comparing Y today with X 10 years ago, uh, and you work with X for maybe one month, and you were testing something, and well, it's a bit uh, uh, hard to, to compare this uh, using this, this criteria. So, most of the comparisons out there uh, have some bias. Why? Because it's very hard to find somebody with really good understanding of both uh, Postgres and MySQL technologies. Uh, the internals are not comparable. Feature-wise, they are, but uh, the internals are not uh, exactly the same. But this is not always bad. What I mean, if God uh, gives you lemons, you make lemonade. If God gives you Postgres DBAs, then use Postgres. Don't try to uh, do something different because, you know what, I attended a conference and everybody was talking about whatever database or somebody said in uh, a meeting, why? I, I remember, this is a true story, I remember uh, in a meeting with a client, the client said, why don't we use uh, NoSQL? And I said, I, I don't know. Why <laughs> should we use NoSQL? The, the, the question is never negative to you because why don't we sell the company? <laughs> it, it makes no sense. So, uh, I'm, disclaimer, I'm a MySQL DBA, but I will try to be as agnostic as possible. Maybe I don't succeed. Uh, if I don't, I apologize. Uh, because uh, the, the, it's, I'm not trying to sell you uh, either technology, especially because I don't believe your criteria should be based on, on, um, on bias. So I'm just saying that, that I'm uh, my SQL DB just to justify if I say something wrong about Postgres, okay? <laughs> One relational database is pretty much the same as another, right? Well, uh, no, they are not the same. They do the same, but, but they do the same uh, in different ways. And it's very important to understand those differences uh, because by understanding those differences, you can decide which technology is better for you. Okay, and this is extremely complex because your requirements are very diverse. So uh, I can't 
th there's no simple rule. If you write a lot, use Postgres. No. If you read or if you need whatever, no. it's not that easy because it depends on the exact write or, or read patterns and sometimes even application developers don't know their access patterns. So <laughs> it's hard to, 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 it's very complex to, to decide. So if we compare Postgres and MySQL, both are relational, both are open source, both are popular, both are old enough to be allowed to drink, and this is sometimes not cool, okay? Sometimes it looks like being version 16 or being version 8 is not cool and being 0 0.21 is cooler, but uh, in, in our case, it's a proof that both uh, uh, pieces of software are consolidated and pretty much stable. The differences, if you Google, you will find these are the most important differences. Uh, Postgres is supposed to have a better SQL standard support. It's ruled by, by mailing lists. Uh, MySQL is supposed to be easier. It's ruled by Oracle, uh, although the community has, has a lot of uh, things to say. And the devil is in the details. Uh, in, in Spanish we say, uh, 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 where does uh, by San Vincent go? It means, donde va Vicente, donde va la gente, it's where the people go. It's uh, the equivalent to monkey see, monkey do. So what is the people doing? What we are seeing is that uh, open source database trend are growing enough to compare with commercial uh, databases. Actually, two years ago, the, the, the open source databases uh, uh, became more relevant than, than the commercial ones. And if we look uh, per database, um, yeah. we have this. So we have that uh, MySQL is trending to surpass, uh, to uh, um, be more relevant than, than Oracle. And we see a huge grow in, in Postgres in the future. Okay? So uh, probably in the next five years or so, we will see that both databases will be the leaders in the database market. So let's go to Emit. The architecture. There are plenty of differences between Postgres and MySQL. If I have to choose one, this is the one I think is the most important, especially because this is something that is only a characteristic of MySQL. MySQL has a two-layer architecture. One layer is the SQL processing uh, uh, layer, and the other one is the engine layer. The, what this um, allows is to have different engines. Okay? You can have uh, InnoDB, but you can have RocksDB, you can have Black Hole, you can have different engines that define how the data is stored. Uh, if you really uh, want to have a, a fast uh, database and don't care very much about integrity, I recommend you use the black hole engine. Uh, it will be really very fast. Your application will be mm, extremely fast uh, with no data, of course, because it's like that null. So, <laughs> but um, uh, it's, it's a proof that, um, that uh, the, the, uh, MySQL has a, an additional flexibility with engines. And somebody can say, okay, what's the, the sense of having a, a, an engine like Debnull? We've been using this engine in the past for replication purposes. So you, 
uh, replicate from one database to another database that has the dev null engine, and then from that database that has the dev null engine to another one. And you have, for example, 5.1, 5.6, and 5.7, and you are replicating from 5.1 to 5.7, okay? Which, by the way, in theory is unsupported. Um, so the, the, the fact is that when we say uh, MySQL, usually we are talking about InnoDB, okay? which is now is the, the, the default engine. So in, in this presentation, probably I will be talking about MySQL and InnoDB, and uh, both terms are valid. But if you are using another engine, uh, then it's different. So here is the MySQL DBA producing MySQL. No, no. Uh, when I said that engines make a difference, uh, they make a difference. And if you need a different engine, that's great. But 99%, actually 99.9999% of, of database users don't need additional engines. So it does not make a difference for the vast majority of, of users. Almost everybody runs uh, uh, in a DB. But knowing about the layer architecture uh, uh, is, is good because it helps you understand some of the internal concepts of MySQL and this, uh, how this impacts performance. To, to make it short, there's something, for example, called Handler. A handler is how the MySQL layer uh, talks to the engine layer. And there are different handlers for different operations. So when you see there's a handler that uh, is prominent, probably means that you are doing a lot of full scans. Okay? Postgres, the heap. The heaps don't lie. Um, the, the tuples are stored in, in the Postgres uh, uh, SQL uh, heaps. The tuples are stored in, in a heap, okay? And we identify the tuples by uh, two values together called the CTID. And these values are the page and the location in the page, okay? Uh, data is unordered. Actually, it's not that data is unordered. The, the thing is that data is written in the same order, is stored in the same order is written. So if you write order data, it will be ordered. If you write uh, in a random order, then the data will be stored in a random order. One really important difference is that updated or replaced rows are kept in the heap. This means that old versions of a row, if you update, the old version will be kept, will be kept in, 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 in the same table. Okay? And in the heap, there, are, there is a lot of metadata, but relevant for us uh, in this presentation is uh, these three uh, values, the xmin, xmax, and T ctid. The xmin identifies the transaction that inserted the row. The xmax, the transaction that removed the row or not. And when I say or not, I mean, if I try to remove the row and roll back, I'll have a value here, okay? And the T ctid, that identifies the next tuple. So if I replace the row, I will point, this is the CTID of the next uh, tuple. Okay? Uh, th those um, values are 32-bit integers that can wrap around. If you have experience with, with uh, Postgres, you've probably you've heard about this. If not, uh, we'll discuss this, this later. The pros of the heap, the inserts are really very fast because you have to do nothing, just uh, insert at the end. 
this is very important. New data is placed together. So this uh, is very good for a temporary locality. In theory, the data we are inserting uh, will be related with data being inserted in the, in, in the same period of time. Okay? So this means that somehow related rows will be kept together. It's very simple to manage, it has no, no complexities, the normal uh, way. And the rows are found by location. So you, if you know the page and the location in the page, it's very easy. You just need to access that page and then go to the position of the page and voila, you have the row. <coughs> the problems. Fragmentation. What happens if I start removing data? I will have holes. Okay? I can have pages that are not completely full. Okay? I can have pages that have just 10% allocated. Okay? Rows are found by location. So it was a pro, but it's also a con. Why? Because sometimes certain operations force us to modify indexes. If I, um, uh, if I modify a row, I'm, I will create a new version of that row that will be located using a different CTID. And if I have an index that points to that row, I will need to modify the index. Okay? So any change I do, if I reorganize the table for whatever reason, I will need to reorganize the indexes. Anything that I do that can move a row will involve reorganizing or, or changing all the pointers to that row. Uh, these two facts make that um, uh, you need periodically to rebuild because you can have fragmentation and also the fact that you uh, place the old versions in the table forces you to have free space inside each page for updates. Okay? And what is important is that you need that amount of space for the whole row. You don't have, um, if you have a huge table and you change just one file, one field, sorry, you will have a full copy of that row in the same page or another page, but you will have a, two versions of, of the row instead of just the, the modified field. The InnoDB clustered index, in InnoDB, everything is an index. All the tables are an index. And this means that, for example, you always need a primary key. If you don't define a primary key, InnoDB will create, sorry, will create one for you. And <coughs> the problem is that it will be hidden. You will not be able to, to access that primary key. But there will be a primary key. Um, when you do an update, that row is modified on the table, even before the commit. Okay? So what uh, MySQL does, uh, sorry, it, you know, DB does, is assuming that you are going to commit. So if you modify a row, I, I will change it. And if you commit, well, that's done. I have nothing to do. If you roll back, then I have to undo the, the changes. And the metadata here is just two fields. The transaction ID that identifies the last uh, transaction that modified, uh, the, the last identifier of the transaction that modified the row, and a pointer to a rollback segment. A rollback segment is where we store the old versions 
of the row. Okay? In, in Postgres, the, the old versions were stored uh, inside the table, and in, in uh, MySQL, the old versions are stored in, in rollback segments. Pros. Data is stored by primary key. This means that it's sorted. So if you uh, have to do often range scans based on primary key, data is, is sorted. Uh, uh, the, the rows are, are together. You have no fragmentation. This is something people is not uh, aware. The fact that you have an index <coughs> sorry, <coughs> means that when a page is empty, it's not pointed by, uh, it, it disappears from the index. You can release it. While with other engines, an empty page is in the middle. So uh, the, 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 there's no access for an empty page. So you just mark it as, as empty. And actually, if it's not fully empty, uh, the, 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 the engine is clever enough to look at the surrounding pages to see if it can merge those pages and and free uh, it completely. So if you have, if we have two pages, 50%, uh, the engine will merge them and will release that space. So this means that in the worst case scenario, you will have 50% uh, 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 allocation, okay? But this is really very an edge case because you need to remove rows from each page just to make sure that it's it's fifty percent. In this case, you need to rebuild. But it's it's it's. I've seen this. I would say never. Okay. Uh, the rows are found by primary key. Uh, which is good if you have uh, primary keys because you save going to the primary key index and then going to the table. You just go to the primary key index and the table itself is the primary key index and you find the row. And it's very, really very good at sequential inserts. Why is good at sequential inserts? Uh, because uh, InnoDB makes a trick. It stores in the page the direction of inserts. So while you insert data in the page, uh, when it arrives to the end of the page, it, the page is full, it says, OK, I've been inserting values that are growing. Yes, this means that I can keep this page as is and open a new page, empty. And the next values will go to the new page. Okay? If the, the inserts are random or go in another direction, I'll create a page on the other side. And if they are random, then I'll consider if it makes sense to split the page. Okay? So if we do sequential inserts, it will create pages almost completely full, and one after the other. The cons, it's very bad if the, the inserts are not, not sequential, because you tend to create uh, uh, empty spaces. Okay? Uh, you need a primary key. Okay? And if you don't use it for whatever reason, it's a table that has indexes, but doesn't have a primary key, you need to generate somehow a primary key. And it's also a bad thing, sometimes rows are found by primary key. What does this mean? Okay. Uh, in in, in um, Postgres, we had that the index had the CTID to find the row. In InnoDB, what you have is that the, in the, the secondary indexes have the primary key. Okay? This means that if I have a large primary key, my secondary indexes will be very big. Okay? Because 
it's not something as an integer for the page and an integer or maybe eight bytes for the eight bits sorry for the the page, the row inside the page no i can have if i have a primary key that's large then all my secondary index will have inside that primary key and also when i access using a secondary index i do i access to two indexes first the secondary index and then with the primary key i go to the <laughs> table that itself is an index and i need to do the, the, the index access. Secondary indexes, uh, in, in, uh, I'm, I'm using MySQL uh, wording because in, in, uh, in, in MySQL a secondary index is, as the primary table is an index, all the other indexes. Uh, in this, the sense I'm using here is all the indexes that are not primary key. Postgres has something great. You have a lot of different types of indexes, while in MySQL you just have one type. The problem is that if you rebuild the table, you need to rebuild the indexes. If you migrate or move for whatever reason a row, you need to migrate or move that uh, row in the index, even if you are not modifying any of the, the columns uh, in the index. The good thing is that the, the indexes are smaller because uh, the CTID is not, not a big one. In, in the case of InnoDB, you have only B3s. The indexes are larger because you, you need the primary key. The good thing is that some rebuilt operations do not affect uh, the, the index. For example, a page split. Okay, A page split does not need to uh, notify all the affected index that something has happened on the, on the primary table. There is just one version of, of the row. This is not completely true. If a row is deleted, the old version is kept, but is marked at, as, as deleted. Okay. And there's something called the change buffer that delays writes to secondary indexes. So, and it can delay writes for a really long time, okay? Actually, it uh, usually it flushes the writes when that page is accessed. So if it is not accessed, it can be a, a long time without, without uh, um, making the, the, the change active in the secondary index. And BCC, well, this is multi-version concurrency control. I guess more or less everybody knows what does this mean. <laughs> uh, it's in our databases, we have a ton of users, a ton of transactions running at the same time, modifying data, writing. We have transactions. We have to see the old versions because I'm running a transaction while somebody is incrementing values and things like that. So dealing with all this concurrent access, read and write access, you have different methods. And one of the methods is the multi-version concurrency control. Both databases use this method. The trick here is that you have different versions of the row to avoid locking access. Okay? How uh, this is implemented in Postgres? Um, rows are inserted and deleted. You never update. If you update a row, what you do is um, mark the old version as deleted and insert a new one. This means that you generate a new CTID, blah, blah, blah. Those new rows are stored in the same table and often, if possible, in the same page. Okay? This means that if you have a lot of uh, changes in, in certain uh, tables, you will have a lot of 
old versions stored uh, inside that, that same table. The Xmin and Xmax, as I said before, uh, well, the CTID is different for each version. Uh, there is something to mitigate this. It's called the hot updates. The hot updates, in theory, sometimes allow you not to change the secondary index when there's a change in the in the heap table. Okay, but you can only use them under some circumstances. Okay, and you have the the. The two values we said before that identify the transactions that modified that that row, and you have some also something called the uh, the commit log. This is a list of all the transactions that have ever been executed in the database with the state of that transaction. Okay, this list <coughs> is cleaned when you do something called vacuum. But if you don't do it, you will have a list of all the transactions saying transaction one committed or transaction one million uh, aborted. How do I know if a row has, has a value I need? If um, the X mean value uh, in the row is bigger than my transaction ID. I'm a transaction ID 10, and I go and see that the row has a value of 11. This means that this row was uh, created after uh, I was born. I started as a transaction because it has a, a number that is higher than mine, so I should not see that, that row. If um, the, the, that, the transaction ID of the row is smaller than mine, this means that it, the row was created before I was born. So I, in theory, I should be able to see it. But now the problem is if that row has been or not modified. To know if the, that row has been or not modified would be de deleted. This means that we have xmax defined. If, if xmax is empty, the row was created before I was born and is still active. I can see it. If xmax is defined, I need to make sure that the transaction that uh, deleted the row has committed. Then I have to go to the commit log and look at the transaction and see is active. Uh, if it's active, I shouldn't see the version. If it's, it has committed, I should see the version. If it, if, if it has rolled back, I shouldn't see it. Okay? So it's a bit, I need to look at different uh, values just to make sure that's the version I, I have to see. In some cases, I have to check the transaction log. I need to, to go to the history and say, okay, this transaction, um, was committed. Who removes the old versions? The vacuum cleaner. Okay. Uh, in the case of InnoDB, it's based on rollback segments. All versions are stored in the rollback segment, assuming that commit will happen. So we change the table and store the old version in the rollback segment. In this case, we have uh, a row metadata that allows us to, to find the, the, the correct version. I will not dip into the, the details. Okay. But I want to say something. Long running transactions can require a lot of rollback segment accesses. In the case of Postgres, we have a problem. All the versions are in the table and sometimes they are together. And this is a problem because it consumes a lot of space. But this is great because if I need to find different versions of the row, probably they are together. They are in a page that I already have in memory. So I don't need to access this. In the case of rollback segments, if I have a long-running transaction that, 
that uh, and lots of data has been modified, I can go to look for a row and say, oh, it's modified. I have to go to, to row or back segment. Oh, somebody modified. I have to go again to row back segment and again to row back segment. And <coughs> as um, the row back segment uh, changes happen in time, for all the database, the, the, the changes are not together. So maybe I'll have to go to disk to read uh, uh, the rollback segment. So long running transactions can do a lot of harm in, in, in my SQL. The, here are the, the, the details. And one of the good things is that you don't need to do vacuum. OK? Uh, there is a background process that purges all roll, rollback segment entries. And this is transparent. So. The vacuum um, is, is something very specific of, 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 uh, of uh, Postgres and is critical. Okay? Uh, you can disable uh, vacuum, don't do it. Okay? <coughs> what uh, vacuum does is it cleans the old uh, versions and that's perfect, that's great. But it also does something. In, in, in Postgres, the transaction IDs are small. I think they are 32 bits. This means that if you have a lot of transactions, it can happen, actually it will happen, that you will have repeated transaction IDs. And as we said, data is stored with the transaction ID. So if you repeat transaction IDs, how you know if this row is in the past or in the future? Imagine you find a row that has a transaction ID 10 plus your transaction ID. So the, the trick here is that um, you, by doing vacuum, what you do is freezing some rows. There is a special transaction ID that freezes the row. I think it's the transaction ID 2. Okay, so what vacuum does is um, it looks at the table, removes old rows, and for the uh, rows that have to stay, it checks the transaction ID, and if it's an old transaction ID of a transaction that is not active and was committed, then it says, okay, I'll freeze that, that row. I use the transaction ID too, and once all the transactions, <coughs> sorry, all the rows of the original transaction have been frozen, I can remove the transaction from, from the commit log. OK, so the vacuum will purge the commit log and also it will mark some transaction as frozen. If you don't do this, sooner or later, the database server will say, oh, I have to stop. I can't continue because there is a risk of transaction wraparound. Excuse me, the full vacuum cannot be done in this, right? No, the full vacuum cannot be done in... Uh, you need to have full access to the table. But to freeze rows, you don't need full vacuum. Okay? <coughs> full vacuum is only needed if you want to release the space allocated by deleted rows. But if you have 5 gigabytes um, by screen, and the table is 10 gigabytes, Yes, yes, yes. You need, if you want to, to make a full vacuum, you, vacuum, sorry, you need to have at least the same space that the table has. In, uh, it, this is a general rule. If you want to recreate an index in MySQL, you will also need uh, that amount of space. This means that if you have a several terabytes table, you need several ter terabytes free space. Uh, Postgres has something specific, very um, 
things that, that uh, uh, MySQL does not have. One of those things is materialized views, which is very helpful in terms of performance. And, and well, the list is, is quite long. I, I will, I'm running out of time, so you can find this. So. <laughs> Um, there's something interesting is the visibility map. Uh, the visibility map is uh, a map of the pages that have changes or not. And is used to avoid vacuum looking at pages that have no changes. Okay, so when a page has changes, uh, there's an uh, entry for that page in the visibility map. And this helps uh, make the, the vacuum uh, process faster. There's also something called Toast. The oversized attribute, the storage technique, it's, this is quite similar to what InnoDB does. Is if you have data that does not fit inside a page, you store that uh, data out of band. You store it somewhere else. Postgres has roles and sorry, Postgres has roles and are more popular than than roles in in MySQL. MySQL also has roles, but the implementation is a bit dirty because uh, it uses um, actually it's like users. Okay, the the syntax is pretty much the same. It's not well implemented. One great thing. You have things like filter, for example, this is great. And, and MySQL does not have uh, filters. Regarding high availability, uh, this is something that uh, MySQL has really very well uh, 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 resolved. We had in the past, or we still have, but uh, we had uh, Galera, and now we have uh, uh, group replication and in a DB cluster, but with group replication, you already can, can provide a, a good high availability solution. Group replication is quite similar to, to, to Galera. And as we are running out of time, uh, also something that is, is a difference, but Everybody has an opinion about this. Uh, uh, MySQL uses threads and Postgres uh, uh, uses processes. What is where? Who do you love more, uh, Dad or Mom? So it's uh, regarding memory utilization. Uh, MySQL tends to manage the memory, and Postgres uh, tends to rely more on the operating system. What is where? I have an opinion, but I will not share. Um, it depends if uh, it's a dedicated server or not. If you're running a dedicated server, uh, assigning all the memory to the database can, can, can make a difference and can protect you of that uh, sysadmin that decides to BI a 20 gigabytes file and consumes all the file system buffers with uh, a lock and expels all your <laughs> database uh, pages from memory. Um, but at the same time, if you have a, a server that has different applications, it gives you more flexibility. For the MySQL guys, guys, sorry, um, uh, if you allocate, over allocate memory, you will find that uh, all of a sudden your MySQL server dies because the own killer says, oh, this, somebody's consuming a lot of memory. It's different. Different does not mean better. Uh, thank you very much. And that's all.